The sight filled the northern sky. The immensity of it was scarcely conceivable. As if from heaven itself, great curtains of delicate light hung and trembled. Pale green and rose pink, and as transparent as the most fragile fabric, and at the bottom edge a profound and fiery crimson like the fires of hell. Atmospheric, morally and mythically charged, set in fantastical alternative universes and subtly connected parallel lands. A shed in suburban North Oxford might seem an unpromising setting for a new kind of children's literature. But in fact, this is the door into a world, the world of Philip Pullman. The vast audience attracted by his Dark Materials trilogy has, like J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter, bridged all the customary divides of age and gender. Amber Spyglass, the trilogy's final part, was the first children's book to reach the long list of the Booker Prize. It's no accident that Pullman lives and writes in Oxford. It was while working as a school teacher that he began to write stories. His work is rooted in one of the central traditions of children's literature, a tradition whose heart lies here in the city of Oxford. The home of Lewis Carroll, J.R.R. Tolkien, and C.S. Lewis, Oxford has haunted the work of generations of children's writers. Alice in Wonderland was conceived on the banks of the Charwell, and The Lord of the Rings written in an Oxford study. Why do we come here? I don't know. Uh, maybe we don't. Maybe we don't come here because we're fantasy writers. Maybe we become fantasy writers by by coming here. I sometimes feel that the, the the mists from the river come out at night and, you know, seep through the stonework and alter the contours of things and uh, pull this gargoyle's face another way. So when you look at it next morning, things are slightly different and subtly changed, but you can never put your finger on exactly where. And I think it's this mistiness, this vapour in the air. Pullman is Beethoven, you know, he's got so many different, he can be delicate and light, he can be hugely tragic and enormous. And that range is quite unique. His Dark Materials trilogy is an epic adventure that pits its child protagonists against the forces of evil in our own and other worlds. Its success has brought this one-time Oxford student into the front rank of Britain's best-selling writers. The first instalment, Northern Lights, which journeys beyond the tundras of the Arctic, begins here in Pullman's old college, Exeter. Jordan College was the grandest and richest of all the colleges in Oxford. The buildings, which were grouped around three irregular quadrangles, dated from every period from the early Middle Ages to the mid-18th century. It had never been the college that I describe in the book, Jordan College, is a, a mixture of Exeter College and other bits of other colleges, and it's, it's much bigger and grander than Exeter College really is, but I put it here, where, where Exeter is. Lyra and her demon moved through the darkening hall, taking care to keep to one side, out of sight of the kitchen. Lyra reached the dais, and looked back at the open kitchen door and, seeing no one, stepped up beside the high table. Lyra stopped beside the master's chair and flicked the biggest glass gently with a fingernail. The sound rang clearly through the hall. Crouching behind the high table, Lyra darted along and through the door into the retiring room, where she stood up and looked around. These glimpses of college tradition come from Pullman's undergraduate days in the 60s. I left Oxford at the end of 1968 uh, with uh, my third class degree. It was the year they stopped giving fourth class degrees, I, well, otherwise I would have got one of those. Of course, um, the fact that I didn't do terribly well is, is very largely my own fault, but I think that, you know, the teaching might have been a little bit more uh, pointed. I think I might have been uh, kicked a bit more firmly than I was, but they, they don't kick you at Oxford, they give you a glass of sherry. Lyra, the chief character in the trilogy, owes at least some of her adventures to Pullman's own student escapades. Some of the incidents in the book r rose out of things I remembered doing. For example, I, we're standing on the tower now over the lodge and my uh, room was just down there, you can see it from here. 
in fact, it was the window I used to look out of, and not only look out of, but get out of, because there's a, a gutter there, a foot or so wide, and you can climb out and crawl along. I wouldn't dare to do it now. Lyra's Oxford is like a sort of um, image overlaid on the Oxford that you can see today. It's like it, but it's slightly different. And the effect I hoped when I was writing those first few chapters would be of a world that was familiar and yet a little bit, a little bit strange. The first sign of that, of course, is in the, the fourth word of the book. The book starts with the words Lyra and her demon. So you know you're not in a world that's quite like ours. But then it becomes familiar and you think, is it or isn't it? Well, it isn't quite, but it could be, almost. Unlike Tolkien and Lewis Carroll, Pullman is dealing with a recognisable reality, however otherworldly its trappings. But like The Lord of the Rings and Alice in Wonderland, there are more serious issues burrowing beneath the surface. Lyra's adventures are full of incident, a teeming universe rife with witches, armoured bears and evil spirits. Yet there is another journey unwinding before us, from innocence to experience. What Philip has done, he's brought contemporary values and contemporary arguments right back into the fantasy story. And he's made relationships, which are usually rather simple in fantasy stories, as complex as they are in real life. So you get troubled relationships between children and parents, between parent and parent, and you don't quite know what somebody's motivation is. Are they actually out for themselves? Have they been seduced by the idea of power? All highly complex questions. I think of myself as a realist, not a fantasist at all. I don't think I'm doing the same sort of thing as Tolkien or Lewis Carroll because my main interest as a storyteller is in the way that real people behave in different situations, what it really means to be a human being. And if I write fantasy, it's only because by using the, the mechanisms of fantasy, I can say something a little bit more vividly about, for example, the business of growing up. For much of his childhood, Pullman's family were posted around the globe. His father was an RAF officer. The long sea voyages to exotic destinations twisted themselves around the mental landscapes that Pullman was beginning to create for himself. Being at sea is an experience that I'm very lucky to have had. Um, I remember it as being more or less unalloyed fun. The scenery is constantly changing, you see. Um, the sea looks different in different parts of the world. And there are passing ships occasionally. Uh, and then the best of all is when you come to a, to a landfall after days and days at sea. Every port is different. You know, Las Palmas in the Canary Islands or Bombay or Port Said. Terribly exciting. Sharing a room with his younger brother and thrown back on his own resources, he found himself gripped by a compulsion to tell stories. We didn't write it down. It wasn't like the Brontes, you know, writing down their stories and epics and so on. But it was, I suppose, something of the same impulse, just the, um, the, the, the urge to make things up. It was just so much fun. It was also a world of tragedy and separation. Pullman's father died mysteriously in a plane crash in Kenya at the height of the Mau Mau insurgency in the 1950s. Philip was seven. Consciously or not, the lost or orphaned child was to become a feature of Pullman's books. I remember crying, but I remember crying rather dutifully, as if it was expected of me. And I remember thinking, am I really feeling this? I'm crying because I feel I ought... You know, I was always just sort of analysing the feeling. And it, it was rather dutiful because I didn't really know my father. I'd, he'd been an absent figure for a, most, of, most of my life. He's always off somewhere else. My memories of him are of a, a very glamorous RAF officer with the traditional RAF moustache, a cigarette in one hand, pint of beer in the other, uh, roaring with laughter. But I hardly knew him. So you do feel a sense of suddenly you're, 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 you're rather a tragic figure, you know. And it is, of course, the case that Lyra, in his Dark Materials, uh, thinks that her parents um, have died and left her an orphan, and she's uh, being the conceited little so-and-so she is, she's rather proud of this fact. 
Of course, much children's literature, ancient and modern, uses orphans or semi-orphans as its protagonists. You get real orphans, or else you get, as in Arthur Ransom and Enid Blyton, you get temporary orphans, children who pack their parents off in the first chapter and don't see anything of them till the very last, because what children want to find in their books is stories about how good they are and how they could actually manage on their own and how, how great their potential is. And the parent figure coming in and, and making the rules and, and saying, you can do this, you can't do that, just spoils that illusion. The fascination with storytelling that Pullman developed as a child was fuelled by an obsession with sheer narrative, a quality that certain strains of recent children's literature have tended to overlook. I think in recent times there's been such a priority given to everything but basic storytelling. We're in a postmodern, ironic culture. Um, so everything is tricksy and arty. And while there's obviously a place for that, I think people have a very basic instinct, a universal instinct, for storytelling. Once you've wound up a clock, there's something frightful in the way it keeps on going at its own relentless pace. Its hands move steadily round the dial, as if they had a mind of their own. Tick-tock, tick-tock. Bit by bit, they move and tick us steadily on towards the grave. Some stories are like that. Once you've wound them up, nothing will stop them. I couldn't begin with a theme. I couldn't begin with a lesson and then construct a story to tell it. What you do is the, the ingredients of a story, the atmosphere, the characters, some of the incidents, pictures from the story come to you and you have to find out what connects them together and. Uh, and then you have to tell it as clearly as you can. And while you're doing that, you discover what it's about. Clockwork first appeared to me, in the, again, in the form of pictures, a picture of a great big clock, and this bit connected to that bit and doing that, and th this turns that bit, and that connects to the, the bit over there, which goes ticked, and so on. Uh, and that suggested, um, that suggested Germany, where they make clocks, sort of Black Forest setting. And that suggested, oh, 200 years ago, shall we say, German Romanticism. And that suggested the idea of someone who might have supernatural powers, and so on. That's, that's how it all came together. Clockwork is a macabre fairy tale in which a mechanical figure wreaks terrible vengeance on the human beings who've been unwise enough to interfere with it. Part way through writing it, I realised that the theme that all these things were exemplifying was the theme of responsibility. If you say you're going to do something, you should. If you have a child, you should look after him. If you begin to tell a story, you should take it to its finish. Um, and in various ways, all the characters, or some of the characters, fail to carry out their responsibilities. The responsibilities they've voluntarily taken on. And um, catastrophe results. So you discover the theme as you're writing about it. I do anyway. Pullman relies on instinct to beckon his imagination on. This can produce unexpected detours. I Was a Rat, the only book of his so far to be made into a film, grew from a single mental image. The book which I call I Was a Rat began, as all my other books do, with a picture, a picture of a little boy standing up in the moonlight outside the, the door and saying to this bewildered old couple who answered the door, I was a rat. That's all he says, I was a rat. Uh, he's not a rat now, he's a boy, quite clearly a boy. Uh, this was the starting point. What would it be like if a rat really was changed into a boy? How would he feel? How would he learn to be a boy? And part way through the writing of this, I began to think to myself, um, at some stage, I'm going to have to explain how he became a rat. How, he could, how could he possibly become a rat? I didn't know. I didn't think about that at all. And then it occurred to me that, well, Cinderella had had rats and changed them into page boy and lizards into coach and so on. Maybe he was just, maybe he didn't get back to the coach in time. That was it. He missed the coach on the way back. He couldn't get changed back, so he was stuck as a boy. That's how it happened. And then I thought, well, now what can I do with this? Um, do I reveal the Cinderella connection right at the beginning? No, I won't do that. I'll let the readers work it out for themselves. Deliberately didn't want to do that. Oh, Jane! Oh, Jane! I had some wonderful letters from readers about this. You know, somebody was. A parent would write and say, I was reading this together with my 
daughter and suddenly we came to this page and we both looked at each other and said, oh, she's Cinderella, of course. That was exactly the reaction I wanted. Didn't want to give it away at all. But I didn't think of Cinderella until partway through, just as a way of solving the problem I'd set myself. Although no longer a teacher, Pullman continues to communicate the excitement of storytelling to children. I've noticed in my career as a writer that when I make a plan for a story, it doesn't work. It goes dead on me. I don't want to write it. I'm not interested anymore. I start out from the beginning with a sort of vague idea of what the story is going to be about and a sort of vague idea about where it's going to go and, where, and how it's going to end. And then I just start writing and see what happens. I know all the reasons that teachers ask you to make plans. They have to. It's in the national curriculum. They go to prison if they don't. <laughs> but there's a value in not planning. There's a value in letting things happen. There's a value in just writing to see what comes out. Look at the bloody national curriculum and see the way that teachers are instructed to get children to write now. Make a plan, make a plan first and then write the story. That would kill it stone dead for me. You, you mustn't plan things. Let, it, let them happen. Make something up as you improvise and see what you can do with that. That's the joy of storytelling. That's the way real discoveries are made. That's the way real things happen. Not making a bloody plan in the first place and sticking to that like a limpet. That's dreadful. Since leaving the world of formal education, Pullman has lived with his family in the same house for more than 20 years. Like many other great Oxford children's writers, who tended to be hard-pressed university dons. The otherworldliness of his books grows out of a very mundane daily life. Pullman, like Roald Dahl, famous for working from his shed, operates according to a fixed routine. I um, get out of my shed at, I suppose, about half past nine or ten-ish by the time I get down there. And I sit down there until I've filled three pages. Sometimes that just takes me an hour or so, and sometimes it takes me all day, and sometimes it takes me till late at night. But that's, that's the amount I do every day, three pages. I am um, both profoundly sceptical and profoundly superstitious. And one of the bits and pieces I have to have around me is the same sort of paper that I've been writing on for decades. Narrow line paper, blue margin, two holes. Um, I had a, an emergency about... 150 pages from the end of the amber spyglass when I ran out of that sort of paper and I went to the shop and bought some, bought a pad of paper and brought it home and discovered that it had four holes in it. But I found the solution. They also sold in the, the station as these little white stickers and I bought a packet of the white stickers and I stuck one over the hole at the top and another of the hole at the bottom of the page and there we are, two whole paper. And I spent hours and hours happily sticking these things over them so I could finish the book. Many of Pullman's early works were conceived as plays during his days in the classroom in the 70s. Their distinguishing mark has always been a strong narrative tug, but also their magpie eclecticism, drawing on ideas and situations from a bulging library shelf of children's and adult literature. The Sally Lockhart books, for example, are set in the grim and disturbing underworld of Victorian London. Sally herself is a notably modern heroine, a self-reliant teenager, forced to make her own way in the world. But the props come from far back in literary time, from Dickens and Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes mysteries. On a cold, fretful afternoon in early October, 1872, a handsome cab drew up outside the offices of Lockhart and Selby, and a young girl got out and paid the driver. She was a person of 16 or so, alone and uncommonly pretty. Her name was Sally Lockhart, and within 15 minutes, she was going to kill a man. I don't know how conscious this was, but to me, it, it looks clearly like a homage to the 19th century triple-decker de de detective novel, um, a la Wilkie Collins, or, or, or something like that. Uh, there wasn't and isn't any other kind of children's book which is exactly like that, and, and that sets them apart. As well as setting his work in dark underworlds, Pullman doesn't shy away from treating disturbing issues. In the first of the books, Sally undertakes a dangerous journey in her search for a cursed ruby. On her quest, she learns how to use a gun and witnesses the ravages of opium. These are unusual subjects for a children's book, but its underlying message is one of people taking control of their lives. His first books um, about Sally Lockhart, this um, 
Victorian unmarried mother <laughs> detective. And I think, in a way, Philip took on that theme because it's the sort of thing no one else would have dared to do, but it's completely consistent with his general belief that human beings can do anything if they set their mind to it. Pullman's stories are not conventional children's books. It could be argued, of course, that these days there is no such thing as a conventional children's book. But there is something highly distinctive about the way his books deal with ideas. They do so with a sophistication that children's writing has rarely embraced. If it's just a funny story, I'm not interested in it. It's got to say something. It's got to be... It's got to be some... It's got to convey some sort of truth. The thing I was interested in, The Firework Maker's Daughter, was what you have to do in order to make a work of art. Leela, the girl, wants to be a firework maker. She wants to work, make fireworks like her father. What she learns is that she has to go to the grotto of the fire fiend, the great god of fire, and bring back some of the royal sulphur. She goes on a wonderful sort of mythical journey with coming across all sorts of obstacles, and it rounds into the most extraordinary uh, tale which is talking about craftsmanship and skill and the satisfaction of actually doing and making things. Through all his stories, I think it's a characteristic uh, that the children have a, a competence. They're very often orphaned in the best tradition of children's literature and they get on and they triumph on their own. And they often have a skill of some sort which, which will see them through adversity. The idea of craftsmanship is central to Pullman's concept of storytelling. Rather like Tolkien, who spent days manufacturing ancient fire letters and inking in maps of Middle-earth, Pullman's input continues long after the final word has been put on the page. His Dark Materials trilogy, for example, incorporates his own illustrations. Many um, adult books have been made impoverished by having their um, illustrations stripped away. Philip sees the book as a crafted object, um, Perhaps in the way that somebody, again, like Tolkien did, he also drew some of the illustrations. Arthur Ransom drew some of his illustrations. A large part of what governs what I decide to draw is what I can draw. I kept away from drawing a face until the very last chapter of Northern Lights. And I wanted to draw Lyra's face there. It was a real challenge. I'm not sure if I could do it at all. But I wanted to express, I wanted her expression to contain a sense of her awe and wonder at what she's looking at, the, um, the sudden opening being made between the two worlds. I love doing it because it's a it uses a different part of the mind, you see. Uh, the, the sort of patterns you make with shapes are different from the sort of patterns you make with sounds and, and uh, words. Pullman's love of drawing points to a deeper inspiration. The landscapes in his dark materials are directly shaped by Gustave Doré's illustrations to Paradise Lost, Milton's Christian epic about Lucifer, the angel who rebelled, and the fall of man. We did books one and two of Paradise Lost for A-Level, and uh, I just remember the sense of going through this extraordinary stuff, um, and it having a physical effect on me. I mean, it made my skin bristle, it made my heart go faster, it made me almost tremble physically, the power of this language. Into this wild abyss, the womb of nature, and perhaps her grave, of neither sea nor shore, nor air nor fire, but all these in their pregnant causes mixed confusedly, and which thus must ever fight, unless the almighty maker them ordain his dark materials to create more worlds. Into this wild abyss, the weary fiend stood on the brink of hell and looked a while, pondering his voyage. William Blake described Milton as being of the devil's party without knowing it. And it is this reading of Paradise Lost that lies behind many of the themes in Pullman's trilogy. The theme of the story is the business of, well, the Paradise Lost theme, innocence becoming experience, uh, youth becoming adult, children becoming grown up. With the Dark Materials trilogy, he's taking on a huge amount of very complicated um, 
sort of philosophical and thinking about uh, religion, the way of the world, um, the, the whole business of how you know we, we we have a moral universe around us, which all sounds very heavy and ponderous, and yet you can read the book without a thought about any of that, and I hope that most people do, because like all really great children's books, they linger on in the adult mind, um, and they they help you through life in a subconscious kind of way. It took me um, about seven years altogether to do the whole thing. From the moment I first wrote the first word, which was Lyra, to the moment I wrote the last word, which I think is also Lyra. Throughout these constant voyagings into real and imaginary worlds, Lyra is never alone. She has beside her what Pullman calls her demon, a shape-changing animal that guides her through her adventures. The demon is your, a part of your, your personality, your soul or your spirit, whatever you want to call it, which has an external form and it looks like an animal. Now, children's demons can change about. They're always changing all the time. But in adolescence, this power to change gradually fades away and your demon settles only in one form, which you'll have for the rest of your life. Now, that's a very vivid way of saying something which I think is truthful about the way our personalities are mutable and changeable at first and gradually settle down as we learn what we are. If you think of some of the awful things that the, the child characters in Philip's book have to do, they really, it's, it's beyond belief, even in a fantasy book, they could achieve all this themselves. Now, you get round that in other fantasy writing by having the odd wizard, Gandalf, or uh, the odd sort of mysterious figure, who fairy godmother figures who come and give you a boost every now and again. Now, Philip doesn't want anything to do with that, so he gives you this demon, this other self, who is, in psychological terms, it's equivalent to the, the mature part of a human being, the bit you turn to, who says to you, come on, you can do better than that, you'll be all right at the end. Now, but he gives it a physical form. It's the richest idea I've ever had. I don't suppose I'll ever have a better one. <laughs> However distinctively drawn, Lyra nevertheless belongs to an ancient tradition of children's literature. She is a characteristic figure, able to rove back and forth in time with magical powers that will help her to triumph. Like Harry Potter with his invisibility cloak or Bilbo Baggins with his ring, Lyra has a alethiometer, a compass-like device that lets her discover the truth. He's not frightened at all of allowing Lyra, his female character, to behave like a girl at times and to be emotional. Um, just as he's not frightened of letting his male protagonist, Will, who emerges in volume two, The Subtle Knife, uh, to have emotional episodes. He's, he's a large, fully developed character. There's nothing stereotypical about him. Will's vulnerability masks an inherent strength and power. Eventually, with the aid of his magical device, the subtle knife, he is able to cut through into other parallel worlds to help Lyra and himself in their quest against the power of darkness. This is an alternative cosmos where good and evil are constantly at war with each other. It is also a world dominated by the idea, if not the actuality, of God. For Pullman, God has been hijacked by a largely malevolent church with tragic consequences. All branches of the church have been responsible for the most extraordinary cruelty. Whether it's um, torturing heretics, uh, burning witches, hanging innocent old women for you know, supposed dealings with the devil or whatever, um, persecuting other people. You know, wherever you look in history, you find um, a lot of darkness and cruelty and wickedness in the history of what the church has done. I don't think there are many stories that bring that out. That was one of the things I wanted to do. Lyra and Will are fighting against the powerful magisterium, referred to in the books as the authority, a sinister body which wields practically totalitarian religious power. 
They touch not only um, this fight between um, uh, the power of good and the power of evil, but they are very much about um, the issue of uh, religious fascism, uh, the attempt to create the perfect world, and the cruelty and totalitarianism that's involved in that. In the wake of his dark materials and inflammatory comments in the press, critics have noted Pullman's apparent hostility to the Judeo-Christian tradition. The youngsters find it hard enough to get to know the church in the 21st century as it is, without a book which makes them feel even more that the church is always on the side of ignorance and always on the side of oppression. I don't think children reading the book would, would pick up the anti-Christian bit at all, just like children reading the Narnia books, and sometimes adults too, have no idea that it's a Christian allegory until somebody explains it to them. Uh, this, is, this is very much an adult preoccupation. It's not so much an anti-religious feeling thing, it's an anti-authority thing. Um, I call the God figure in the book the authority, the capital A. Uh, and it's, and in the end, I kill him. Between them, they helped the Ancient of Days out of his crystal cell. It wasn't hard, for he was as light as paper, and he would have followed them anywhere, having no will of his own. But in the open air, there was nothing to stop the wind from damaging him, and to their dismay, his form began to loosen and dissolve. Only a few moments later, he had vanished completely, and their last impression was of those eyes, blinking in wonder. Then he was gone, a mystery dissolving in mystery. He portrays a scene which is so shocking. You know, this is not just someone uh, who is uh, an angel or an archangel being killed. It is the god of the Christian tradition, even though Pullman says he's not the creator. He's someone who set himself up to be the creator. This is not so much killing the Christian idea of God as killing the idea of the church or any authority that has to be, that, that's, that says it contains the truth and is sort of interpreted to the rest of the world by a small core of experts, priests, or members of the Communist Party, or those who are in the know. I'm a Republican, I'm a Democrat in this sense. I, what, whatever, whatever's truthful should be available to us all. We should all be able to take part in it and understand it. And that's what I'm getting at, this idea of um, a hierarchy who know things and a mass that doesn't. Inevitably, in a work influenced by Paradise Lost, Pullman borrows a great deal from the Old Testament. Here, though, the book of Genesis is turned on its head with the fall from grace transformed into something positive, replacing innocence with knowledge. But his dark material's engagement with religion goes further than this. The demon can be seen as the physical embodiment of the soul. And Pullman imports the crucial idea of dust, whether it acts as a metaphor for original sin, as some have suggested, or is simply based on the idea of human growth and experience, dust lies at the heart of Pullman's world. And when she looked through her spyglass and saw the relentless outward drift of the dust, the shadow particles, it seemed to her as if happiness and life and hope were drifting away with them. She could find no explanation at all. The way I understand dust is that it represents the accumulation of experience, so that we start off um, the world very flexible and open, and then as things happen to us and we make decisions in life, certain kinds of doors close behind us, um, and we kind of acquire what looks like dust here. We get a shadow around us, perhaps. That, mean, that means you can't go back the way that you were. You can't remake yourself. I think I discovered what I believed in the course of writing this book. I discovered what I, um, what I believed to be true about where we come from and what it means to be a human being and what happens when we die and all this sort of stuff. Such things as um, the need for a natural explanation, not a supernatural one. 
the need to celebrate the beauty and the wonder and the exquisite joy of being in the physical world. Not to put them aside and say, oh, but in heaven it's like this, but it's better. As you get in C.S. Lewis, for example. This world is all very well, but it's soon as corrupt. But there's a much better place somewhere else, elsewhere, which is called heaven. And there all the lemonade is always sparkling and the skies are always bluer, even bluer than the blue sky. Well, that's, that's something I reject passionately. There's nothing bluer than our blue sky. The end of his dark materials, where the survivors set about building their own Republic of Heaven, is a conscious secular version of the great Christian epics, human beings determining their own ends in the absence of the divine. He seems to me to write like some of those wonderful Victorian humanists who rejected religion and took up socialism, philanthropy, and preached the idea that we could really live in a commonwealth of, of human beings who respected each other, had um, a shared economy. It's a sort of William Morris and, and the early Fabians, that sort of vision of society. And uh, it's, it's impatient with any political shortcomings, and it's firmly based upon an optimistic view of human beings, that if we treat other people right, they will treat us right, and we don't need a whole panoply of oppressive beliefs to make us do this. With the success of Pullman and J.K. Rowling, children's writing has acquired an adult readership and a prestige that it hasn't possessed for decades. In an increasingly ordered and rational world, the otherworldly and fantastical landscapes discovered by Harry Potter, Lyra and Will seem to touch on something fundamental in readers' minds that would otherwise be denied expression. I think that's part of the appeal of these books, that they enable us to be children again, they enable us to lose ourselves, uh, to escape from the world of adult responsibility and for the period of just reading the book, uh, to enter into the childlike world of fantasy again. And I think in, this, in our current uh, society, that is a very uh, powerful attraction. The typical comment I get um, from adults is, I don't usually read fantasy, but I read this and enjoyed it because it seemed to be doing something other than fantasy was doing. And they'd never have found that out if it had been an adult book because it would only have been read by the fantasy fans. A rich, fantastical universe, constructed by a writer who claims above all to be a realist. All the traditional props of classic children's literature supporting a very different kind of moral sensibility. A literary tradition and a city reinvented by a mind intrigued by questions as much as certainties. But perhaps Philip Pullman's true achievement is to take us on a journey in search of far-flung shores and to the edge of dazzling horizons a world coloured by an imagination that, like his readership, knows no boundaries. <laughs>